We are back, we are back. Another family worship session. We're talking about God's sovereignty in revealing and concealing truth. Revealing and concealing truth. Okay. Who's gonna pray tonight? Oh wait, last night was me and Juliana's turn. So tonight is Tatiana and Rihanna. Yeah, I, said Juliana would pray last night. I know. That's why that's why I prayed, because I should have started the prayer, but I didn't do it. And then Juliana turn would have come. But I ruined it last night. So our turn has passed. It's your turn. So which one of you is gonna pray first? To open up. Alright. Ready? Okay. I'm gonna close my eyes and bow my head. Amen. 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 All right. So you're going to look at something. We're going to look at something that is very, very profound. Let me see, if I can, I can fix this this thing better. Okay. All right. Something that is very profound. It is God's sovereignty in truth. And deception. What is that in my hair? All right. God's sovereignty in truth and deception. Okay. So turn to First Thessalonians. Yeah, but keep keep that marked though. Keep it marked. Okay. I just want page. Wait. Let me see if I am in the right place. Yes, it is. First Thessalonians chapter one. Oh, how did you know that? Oh, okay. Okay, chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 6. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Now, that word there, choice, is uh, the Greek word eklektos, which means elect. Okay? It means elect. Okay, so we can say his election of you. And here's the reason why we know, this is Paul saying, knowing brethren beloved by God, his election of you. How did Paul know that these people in Thessalonica were elected? Hold on, I'm going to pause this. Alright, so as I was saying, I can, put, I can put the two videos together. It's fine. Okay, edit it um, in, in the editing process. All right, so I was asking, how does Paul know that they are elected? Following verse four is the reason four or because because or for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sins. So, sometimes when the gospel goes out, it goes out in word only. You hear that? Sometimes it goes out in word only. It does not go with power and it does not go with conviction. What is conviction? Repentance and faith. It does not go with that so i can go to a market and i can turn on my sound system and i can get my mic and i can preach the inexhaustible gospel of the living god and people hear and people walk away and nothing happens it just, just bounces off but god's word always does something because what you realize is this if someone hears the gospel and they don't believe the gospel, they are now someone who has the knowledge of the gospel or has been reminded of the gospel and did not believe. 
they are actually in a worse place than they were before if they don't believe because now they have something against them that God can judge them for on top of all of their other sins. As the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 5. Who wants to go there? Romans 2 verse 5. Restoring because of your... Verse 5. Verse 6. But because of your stubbornness and... No, no, we're not going to read it. Part, you are restoring of God for years of the day of God and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Wow. Because of your unrepentant heart, you are storing up what? Yeah, so it's 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 piling up. It's coming up into a mountain. It's 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 piling up. So I preach the gospel to you. You don't believe that is a part of your store of sins and judgment. So the gospel doesn't just go out and nothing happens. Something happens, as the Bible says in um, Isaiah fifty-five verse eleven. God's word does not go out and return to him without accomplishing what he sends out to accomplish. And the gospel goes out for two reasons. For two reasons. It goes out for judgment. Because if you don't believe, you have worst judgment. Or a judgment that is worse than before because now you've been reminded of the gospel or you have now heard the gospel. So judgment or grace, meaning the gospel goes out with power and conviction and you are given the grace of God that causes you to believe. So this takes burden, burdens and a burden off the preacher. I can go out and I can preach and I can go home and I don't have to worry about anything because I know that when God's word goes out, it's going to do exactly what he wants it to do and I can just let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. So, does God send his word out with power every time? The power to judge and the power to give grace? Yeah. Does he send out his word with conviction all the time? No. No? You say that with conviction? All the time? No. Does his word cause people to believe and repent all the time? Yeah. So, so I can go down there and preach to the people on Sunday and it will cause them to believe? No. Just ask you if it means all the time. You said yes. Yeah. All the time until that it will um, change their hearts and hide mm -hmm. Okay. Which brings me back to the question. Does God's word always change the hearts of people for them to believe when it goes out? No. What do you say? Okay, good. Good. We're getting somewhere. Does God have a right to use His Word to change the hearts of those He wants to change? Yes. Is it unfair if He does not change the heart of Michael Jones but He changes the heart of John, John no. Jones? No. Why isn't, why isn't, why isn't it unfair? Who can tell me? Why isn't it unfair? How, why can't John Michaels say, that is unfair. How can God cause one to believe and not cause the other to believe? Well, God can do whatever he pleases. What do you say? You don't know? Julia, do you know? Why isn't it unfair for God to choose one and not the other? Okay. Tatiana, what do you say? Okay, let me tell you. You ready? No. You ready? You ready to tell me? I said, what would I show you? Alright, alright, let me tell you. So you guys should know. Right? It is not fair. Sorry, it is not unfair because what all of us deserve is wrath and judgment. So if God decides to save one, 
It is not unfair, it is grace. Yeah. yeah, so I always say, okay, so I always I always bring this up and I, I am very aware that those who are listening to me online, if you know what the word unfair or fair means, you're thinking what I know you're thinking. Anyways, we gotta get back to this. Focus y'all, focus, focus, focus. Back to what I was saying. So what I was saying is this. All of us deserve one thing and one thing only. If we get anything else, then it's grace and mercy. When God decides to change the heart of someone, cause them to believe, and they believe, and he doesn't do it to someone else, what you always hear, and if you ever go out and you speak to someone about this, you will always hear the words, unfair, that's unfair, that's unfair. You will hear people crying, unfair, unfair. And then you ask them this, what if God was only fair? What if God was only fair? Mm -hmm. What is fairness? Fairness is giving something. Good job, good job, yes. Fairness is another word for justice. Mm -hmm. Fairness is another word for justice. So you're complaining about God being unfair. What if God was only fair? Where would that leave you? Where would that leave me? Where would that leave every human being on this planet? Hell. Burning. Dead. Done. That wouldn't be unfair. That would be fair. Yes. Yes. That would be fair. Okay. So. Here's the word now. So, if unfair is to give someone something they don't deserve, how isn't giving grace equivalent to being unfair? You see the logic? Let me say it again. Being unfair if I am unfair to you, let's say you work for fifty thousand dollars, and I give you forty, I am unfair. I did something to you that you did not deserve. Mm -hmm. Good. So, grace is to receive something that you don't deserve. Mm -hmm. Undeserved kindness. All right. So how is it? that receiving grace is not also equivalent to being unfair. I'm not playing with your brains, I'm just asking a question. Julian has good at this. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Let me, let me not nail on that. I remember one time when I made a video about this, about God being unfair. Because when he gives grace, he is being unfair, in a sense. And what I mean by that is this. Every time God gives grace, he is withholding justice. Every time God withholds justice, he is giving grace. You can't have one and not the other. So if there's a guy named Adrian Smith, God decides to give him grace. God is also in that same event and action being unfair. Why? Because this man was supposed to get death and hell, but God did not give him what he is worthy of and what he deserves, which is unfairness. And on the flip side, God is giving him grace, something that he does not deserve, and something that he has done everything to not receive. It's grace. It's, it's a beautiful truth. But when you look at the meaning of words, this is what we're left with. This is what we're left with. So someone's, but, but the, the argument that people always give is, 
God is unfair. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? In the sense of these people deserve to have the grace of God, but God is only giving it to this person. Why didn't he give it to these persons? And the mistake is thinking or having the presupposition that God owes everyone grace or God owes everyone salvation. But God doesn't owe anyone anything. Doesn't owe us anything. Good. He owes us justice because of our sins. So, I am glad God was unfair to me by giving me grace. I am glad God was unfair to me by withholding justice. I am glad for the unfairness of God to me. But God is never unfair to someone who does not receive grace. God is, here's the word, here's the word. When God does not give grace to an individual, what God is being in that event, in that action, is fair. He's being fair. He's being just. When he sends someone to hell. So everyone who will be in hell in the future, everyone who is going, everyone who is in Hades right now, burning, and everyone who will be in hell ultimately, God is being fair with them. And God is being just with them. Alright? So remember, so this, this whole Bible study message is about God's um, sovereignty over concealing truth and revealing truth. Okay? So, I initially told you all to go to 2 Thessalonians. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And, and and verse 10 and 11. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. Can God cause someone to believe something that is false? Can God cause people to believe lies? According to this verse. Yeah. And if I were to tell you how God does it, I, 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 I couldn't tell you how. But I could rationalize a little bit. If God withholds truth, then you will believe lies. If God decides not to give you truth, then what you are left with is the opposite of truth, which is lies. So if God says, I am not going to reveal the gospel truth to this individual, or I'm going, to I'm going to have the gospel preached, he's going to hear it, but I'm not going to have my gospel go forth with my power and with conviction. When God does that, he is in a passive way causing people to believe lies because he's not giving them the truth of the gospel. Does God have a right to do that? Of course he does. He can do whatever he wants. Now, this message, this family worship session, that's not supposed to be about. What I want to do is, I want to show you guys the this amazing truth. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Julia, we read it already. Do we read it already? What, you, do you want to read something? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 9. Julian, I want to read it. Right, We're going to help her out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, verse 8 and verse 9. end it. Alright, I'm going to read it. You ready? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Yes. That is amazing. Let me see if I can find the... The, um... other passage here that too 227 <laughs> All right, so when it says, for by grace you have been saved, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Look, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, what is the gift of God? The grammatical, the same passage we just read, the grammatical structure here points to the fact that both the grace and the faith is the gift from God. And that is what we're saved. How we're saved. So here is the whole ending of the whole thing. All three of you believe the gospel by the grace of God. You don't deserve God's truth. I don't deserve God's truth. There are places in this world right now where people are dying and they never heard the gospel. Is that fair? Good. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If God did not send the gospel to those places in the world that people are dying, all that's happening is justice. There is no injustice. And there is no unfairness. That's all that's happening. Justice. Justice. But when we receive... When we receive the gospel <laughs> and we believe the gospel, it is grace. So, since you guys believe the gospel, you must thank God. I mean, God, thank you that I believe the gospel. Because I could have been one of those people who don't believe it. And on top of that, there are those who get the gospel every day. Those who hear the gospel every day. Those who live in Christian countries and they don't believe it. Worst judgment. Worst judgment. You're going to be held accountable. As we explained the other night, how can someone be accountable for their sins even though God providentially decrees and ordains all that comes to pass, including the actions of humans and angels? We explained it. They're going to be held accountable for their sins. Which means that y'all got to shine your light so that people can be so that people can see your light shine and glorify God in heaven. Let God use you as a means of saving people through your life and your ministry. Yeah? All right, all right. So just 20 minutes. And end this here. So who's going to pray to close? Atiana, you ready to pray to close? See, this one wasn't so long. Last time I think we went for 40 minutes? Yeah, 40. Yeah. All right, let's, let's I'm pray. I'm 45. Bow your hands and close your eyes. And clasp your hands to your hands first. Ready? Heavenly Father, we come to you, Grace, and we worship you, Lord Jesus. We come to 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 you, Lord Jesus. Yes, to help us to remember everything that we have learned tonight. In your name, my prayer. Amen. 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 So, that was God's sovereignty over revealing and concealing truth. Thanks for watching. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Stay tuned for more. One love.